Welcome to episode 184 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Eileen Romer, who served in the FBI for 20 years. During her bureau career, she investigated white collar crime, violent crime, organized crime, and counterterrorism. In this episode, Eileen Romer reviews her time training her unofficial FBI cadaver dogs, Riley and Bailey, both golden retrievers. She talks about the search and recovery work she and her dogs were assigned, locating human remains at crime sites, including the Pentagon, where she responded with them for 12 days immediately following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. At the time she began working with her cadaver dogs, Eileen Romer was a supervisory special agent and psychological profiler in the profiling unit now known as the BAU, Behavioral Analysis Unit, at Quantico, Virginia. Eileen is a trained police instructor, crisis manager, and crisis hostage negotiator. Later in her FBI career, she was assigned to Gulfport, Mississippi, where she supervised 25 special agents and task force officers and to the Department of Homeland Security as a senior FBI liaison. Following retirement, she worked as a consultant for the National Counterterrorism Center and U.S. Central Command. On October 19, 2019, Eileen Romer will be installed as the president of the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI. Congratulations, Eileen. But before we get to the interview, I want to talk to you about NaNoWriMo. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it is National Novel Writing Month. So during the month of November, you're supposed to attempt to write a first draft of a novel or a memoir, but I guess you could also do a nonfiction book. And this year, I'm going to try it. If I complete the challenge, what I'll end up with is 50,000 words of a first draft of what will end up being about 90,000 words of my fourth book, third novel in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series. So I'm excited. If you're also planning to challenge yourself during NaNoWriMo and you're writing an FBI crime novel or crime thriller, I would love to hear from you. We need to all stick together. And of course, make sure you get a hold of FBI Myths and Misconceptions, which breaks down 20 cliches about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. The audiobook is now out. And currently, Nook and Apple Books slash iTunes are offering substantial discounts but I'm not sure how long the reduced prices will be around. The audiobook, ebook, paperback, and hardback for FBI myths and misconceptions are available wherever books are sold, but you can find an easy link to some of the retailers in your podcast app's description of this episode. If you've already picked up a copy of FBI myths and misconceptions, thank you please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. There's also a link to join my reader team in your podcast app. Once a month, I send out my email digest and try to keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Eileen Romer. Hi, Eileen. How are you? I'm great, Jerry. How are you today? I am fantastic. Actually, for the last couple of days, I've been reading everything that I can on cadaver dogs because it is just a fascinating subject. I like dogs. I have two dogs of my own. And the fact that we have working dogs who are helping us in our investigations is just fascinating. It is fascinating. 
And that's part of the reason that I got involved because I have a long history with, with dogs. I love dogs. And uh, I got a golden retriever puppy. I wondered what she would be able to accomplish, if anything. You know, it's, it's funny that you said that because I had three golden retrievers. Did you have them at the same time? I had two at the same time. Oh, and no. yeah, so the last dog that we got was actually a rescue dog because uh, all three of the golden retrievers died of, of cancer. Oh, and mm-hmm. it's just so sad you know, to see your pets you know, suffer like that. And then for some reason, there's some issue, I guess, with golden retrievers and the way they're being bred. But I love those dogs. They're, such, they're like eternal puppies, always, always happy. And very smart. Yes. That was my experience anyway. <laughs> Well, I learned about you from reading an article in The Grapevine, which is the monthly magazine that's put out by the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI. And as soon as I read the article, I reached out, and I'm so glad that we were able to coordinate our schedules so that I could have you here today. So could you give us maybe just a really high-level overview of what a cadaver dog does. Sure. You know, a lot of people confuse search and rescue and search and recovery. And some people who train dogs, train them to do both. Search and rescue is when you are going out looking for live people who are missing. Search and recovery is when you know that you're looking for death. You're trying to find someone who is probably going to be dead when you find them. And I got interested in this because I was actually uh, transferred to the profiling unit down at Quantico. It was was called something else then. It was the Child Abduction Serial Killer Unit. And my area of expertise became uh, missing children. And so we would often get requests from police agencies and other federal agencies and our own FBI agents out in the field for information about who had a cadaver dog and who, um, what's the proper training? How do you know if it's a well-trained dog? And so down at, at that unit in Quantico, each one of us who was working pro- these profiling cases it seems like we all developed a side collateral duty. And I went to a body recovery class over at Quantico and uh, there was a, an agent there who I had never met and he had a Belgian Malinois and he was doing demonstrations for the class regarding the recovery of human remains with the help of a canine. They had all different methods. You know, they had people who were testing soil, they had machines that could go over uh, the land and see if there was some hot spot where possibly a body was decomposing had been buried. But I had just bought a golden retriever puppy from a breeder. So I was talking to him about whether or not he felt that a golden retriever would be any good at body recovery, search and rescue, I called it at the time because I didn't really know the distinction. So He said, yeah, he had seen um, golden retrievers that were search dogs, and there were all different kinds of breeds that could could learn. And he put me in touch with a woman in Northern Virginia who had been at that time training dogs for about 25 years. In fact, her, her, she had white shepherds. They were beautiful dogs. But her first pet at home, she was a little older than me, uh, had been a World War II German shepherd, retired from the war. So I contacted her and uh, we set up to meet and she was going to test my golden retriever, Riley, to see if she might be any good at search and rescue, search and recovery. I had already started from the time I got her to train her in obedience, taken her to a class, worked with her in the yard. I mean, I was, I would just really wanted to have a well-behaved dog. So I took her up there and, and um, Beth put her through her her paces and said, yeah, she's got the drive. They have to have a good play drive because you have to teach them how to play the game because for a, for a search dog, a working dog, this is a game for them. They learn that they're going to get some kind of a reward if they find 
whatever it is that you are trying to train them to find, whether it be human remains, a live person, money, drugs, you know, all kinds of things. So she did well. She did, uh, she did really well. And I started as a volunteer uh, because at the time there really weren't many people in the FBI who had uh, working dogs. And for the most part, it was not sanctioned by the Bureau having these working dogs. I think um, the hostage rescue team had, had done it maybe before we were working with these dogs, but it was sort of a, a hit and miss sort of activity. So anyway, we started, uh, we started training with this group of volunteers and they were, you know, I was in Northern Virginia. So they were people from Fairfax Fire Department, uh, Fairfax County Sheriff's Office, some non-law enforcement personnel, as well as uh, one or two people who worked with the FEMA team in Fairfax County. Those are the ones who respond to a lot of the disasters around the world. So I had a good group of people that I was going to be associating with. And basically, when you learn how to be a handler, and that's a dog handler, you are teaching your dog while you're being taught. So you're learning together with your dog how to be a team and how to uh, find what it is you're looking to find. And they start you off in search and rescue. We did a lot of the battlefields. We'd go out to the battlefields and on a Sunday morning and spend four or five hours searching. And after about 18 months of this, my dog Riley uh, was put through a test and she passed the test and she became a certified cadaver dog. I believe they have, they have more stringent qualifications. Not, not that the qualifications are any different, but they are uh, licensing dogs now, giving them certificates. And of course we had a certificate because Beth was a qualified um, instructor, but we had our, our group. And that was a group that I, that I spent a good number of years, you know, training with and working with. The training, the training is very interesting because when you go in to the training initially, you wonder, now how are we going to be able to train a dog to find human remains? Because we don't have any bodies that we can use. Uh, yeah, so, that's definitely a question that I, I, I had. Yeah. And a lot of people ask that question, like, how did you train them? Well, there are a lot of different ways. Beth, for one, used to, um, she used to donate platelets. And so whenever she would donate platelets, she would get a little tube of extra of her blood. And that was one of the things we used for training. Another thing we used were, you know, bone fragments that had been found in a, um, in a fire in an abandoned building. I think it was, you know, maybe in one of the big cities. But so I kept this sort of stuff. And, and with the blood platelets, you know, you would put that like on a little piece of gauze and then put it in a, in a closed container and keep it in the garage. Same thing with the, uh, with the, with the bones. I remember one of the first searches I went on with the group and they were, they had, they had actually searched for this man. It was in Northern Virginia, like maybe around Springfield area. And this old man, older man who had Alzheimer's and was in, uh, I think he was home, but he had access to a car and um, he drove somewhere and then walked off and they, they never found him. I remember the team that I was associated with, they had gone out looking for this man. They remembered this case, never could find him. Well, they started to do some construction uh, near some railroad tracks. I remember that. And they had gone through there and cleared the area and they found human remains. You know, they, would, they found like hair, clothing, bones, things like that. And so they asked us to go in and verify with the dogs that these were human remains, which we did. And then we well, I, I have to stop you and, uh, and ask you, mm -hmm. how does the dog know whether it's human remains or a dead animal? Oh, that's interesting. I, you know, I don't know how they do 
but they know. I've been on so many searches where, um, you know, there somebody has found bones and the dogs will go over there and sniff and move on. Whereas if they're human bones, um, they, there's, there's just something about the scent of human remains that's completely different from any other remains. And, and they, they know it and they identify it and they will pass up animal bones and go straight for the human remains. Getting back to this particular case and, and what we trained them on, they allowed us to take some of the soil where, and this man had, had gone missing eight months prior to when his remains were found. You know, Alzheimer's patients have a way, they will just walk in a straight line and it doesn't matter if there's bushes that you think no, no person could get through. They can walk right through there and get stuck and disoriented and that's what happens when a lot of, a lot of people who go missing, who unfortunately are suffering from Alzheimer's. So we take the soil and dig, dig the soil because when a person, when a person um, dies, there is the fluids in their system that go in, you know, as you decompose, the fluids go into the soil. So the soil is rich with that scent. And even if the soil dries, see, you would put it in a jar and the soil will dry and then you just add a little bit of water to it and evidently it brings the scent right back up for the dog. And I can tell you, one of the people in our group, he was a, he was a firefighter, he had some soil from um, someplace in Virginia where they had started building and realized that they had come across Civil War remains. And so he had these in a bag and Riley was tested on that one time. You know, they would put like five bags out of dirt from different places and they were able to identify after it was, what you know, moistened that that had human remains previously in it. So it's, it's amazing. It's just amazing. And I learned so much from working with dogs. So was this something that the FBI paid for this training or did you pay for it out of pocket? No, not at all. They had no involvement in the acquisition of the dogs or the training of the dogs or any of the expenses involved. Now, that being said, Later on, because I was in the unit I was in, most probably in working the kind of cases I was working, there were a couple of instances where I took a trip, and even once I I flew in a bureau airplane with the dog, and they would pay for the travel, but they never paid for anything else. You know, if I was going out on a bureau case, and, and most of the time it was helping a local agency who, you know, had some information that let's say somebody told them, oh, and, and this was, a, you know, a criminal informant telling them, oh, I know so-and-so killed somebody, and they would take you out someplace looking for remains, and of course, you know, most of the time you never found any because they were just trying to get out of a jam themselves. But I did do some of those kind of cases where the Bureau did pay, but never for anything having to do with the training of the dogs. No. And why is that? Because, of course, I know the Bureau does use bomb dogs and other dogs. So what is the difference, the, the distinction between the cadaver dogs and, you know, say, a, a bomb dog? Well, I, th- I think the distinction now is time. You know, I think over time and over the years and since 9-11, is real, 9/11 was when we really demonstrated to the Bureau that there was a, there was a use for cadaver dogs. Okay. So now the Bureau does have cadaver dogs as part of their workforce. I can't tell you that for absolute, I, cause I don't know. After nine 11, our dogs were posted on the Bureau's website. So they did recognize that these were FBI dogs. Now following nine 11, I know they have bomb dogs. Uh, I know they have dogs that the victim assistance program uses, therapy dogs. I, I don't know what the status is of 
search and rescue and or search and recovery. I think the hostage rescue team may have some tracking dogs. But the one thing that we do know for sure is that although they may not be an official part of the workforce, that the FBI does recognize the importance of cadaver dogs and that when there is a case that requires the use, they will go out and utilize uh, that resource. Yes, they did. Whether they do that now, I can't answer. I've been retired for too many years to be um, totally familiar with what they're doing now in terms of the program. Well, of course, I conducted my extensive research Uh (laughs) and I did find a number of articles, recent articles for cases where the FBI did use dogs in order to try to find buried bodies. And let me ask you that question too, because when we're talking about buried bodies, when Mm -hmm. a body is buried deep, deep, deep in the soil, or maybe even a body is under several you know, feet of water or maybe even a body buried under mounds of concrete. How is a dog still able to detect the human remains? In the case of water, and that's my New York accent coming through, but um, in in the case of water, the uh, decomposition process causes gases to come to the surface of the water. I mean, I've been out with dogs on bodies of water and seen a dog alert in a particular spot and they've recovered a body there. In terms of deep burials, for the most part, you've got to have some kind of other information to direct you to an area. And then one of the things that that we did when I was working with the cadaver dogs was put a pipe down into the soil and put numerous pipes down and again, the gases from decomposition would come to the surface. They have, I wish I would have researched this before we sat down to talk because I forget the name. There was a company that used to do deep penetration with electronics of soil and or concrete to see and identify heat sources down below the surface. And that's one way of you know, it, it was a whole process in a body recovery of all different types of resources. The dogs were only one part of that. There were a lot of other uh, assets, resources that were, that were utilized to try to identify where a body might be buried. Well, I know one of the other episodes that I did was about the ERT and decomposing human remains. Mm -hmm. And one of the the things that we really talked about during that episode was trying to make sure that the evidence wasn't contaminated or disturbed. And so I'm wondering when you have a dog and you're looking for human remains in a criminal case, how do you allow the dog to do the work they're doing and also make sure that that evidence isn't contaminated? Well, you have to do very good training of your dog because you don't want your dog to be disturbing the remains. Cadaver dogs work, and search and rescue dogs also, work off leash because they are trying to hone in on a particular scent and they will come into what's called a scent cone. And it all depends on how the air is moving, how much moisture is in the air. And this is all part of the learning process. You have to learn how to get your dog into a position where you can let them take advantage of all these scent signals. I had two cadaver dogs and and they were a little different. They were each a little different. One would sit and the other would paw. And so basically what you had to teach them to do. The one who would sit, she would stop, put her nose down and touch the spot and then sit and look at me for her reward. And that was it. They wanted to be rewarded. That's how we trained them. And uh, with Bailey, he was the one who pawed. I trained him to paw like just in front of where the scent is. And then he would wait for, and you know, and they would every single time, they would do their signal and then look at me like, okay, I found it now. What are you going to give me? What are we going to do? And, 
And in one, it was food. The other, it was a, a round, soft Frisbee. Riley lived for her Frisbee. And Bailey lived for food. And Riley and Bailey, were they, were they both golden retrievers? They were. And Riley is the one I got as a puppy from a breeder. Unfortunately, as you talked about in the beginning, she died uh, at eight and a half years old of cancer. Her mangiosarcoma, which attacks the heart and spleen and is very common in golden retrievers. And no indication of it until she just wouldn't go after the ball one day. The only reason I know what it was is the 9-11 dogs were involved in a study and they wanted all of them to be uh, autopsied. And the University of Pennsylvania paid for that. Actually, they had MRIs every year for like five years. And then when they died, they had autopsies. In Bailey's case, he lived to almost 15. Oh, wow. That's excellent. I got him believe it or not, from an animal control officer in Spotsylvania, Virginia. He had been tied up outside at a what, what was referred to as an unscrupulous breeder's home, and he kept escaping. And I had gone looking. I had spoken to the animal control officer and said, hey, I'm looking for a golden retriever, you know, three, four years old for a family that I know who are really anxious to adopt a golden retriever, but not a puppy. And so he found this dog and eventually they took it away from the person because he was being starved and overbred. And so I took him, had him fixed and was going to give him to this family, but they in the end were not able to take him. He was probably three years old when I got him and I trained him and he was a natural. Immediately he took right to it. And so I had two cadaver dogs. At the same time? Yes. I actually had three, and she was another rescue, but she never, she never got the picture. She never really, because she had been kept in a crate for the first year of her life, and she did not have the play drive. I could throw a ball, and when I finally did train her to go after the ball, she would never bring it back to me. Mm. So in all the training sessions, she would go find she could find with no problem, but she, they have to understand that the game is you go find it, you come back and get your handler and take them to the find. That's how it's done. And she would never come get me. She would go find it, then she'd find the second problem and the third problem, and then she'd come back to me mm. and never take me there. So she never worked. She was fun, but she never worked. Do you have photos of Riley and Bailey? I do. Could you share those with us and I can put them in the show notes of this episode? I would love to do that. Great. Fantastic. You know, one of the things that is amazing about this topic is that as a dog owner, I know that dogs love stinky stuff. Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) the discipline Mm -hmm. that the training must bring to the dog is That's what I really find amazing because I'm sure as they're looking for this decomposed human body, Mm -hmm. there's all kinds of stinky stuff that they would love to explore. Yeah. And if if allowed, you know, they would very, very quickly want to roll around in any other dead animal that was out there. You know, and I think part of it is because they are so play driven. You know, the fact that they're going to get something when they accomplish their task, they're totally connected to that. They want that something, whether it's the Frisbee or the food or the praise. It seems like every dog, every working dog has, not everyone has a different one, but there are so many different ways to reward a dog, food, Frisbees, socks, everything. But yeah, they respond to the reward and that's, that's where you can really discipline them. And some, you know, some are obviously more disciplined than others. When I first got Riley and I first started doing the obedience, I I think I mentioned in the beginning, I would train with her every day because it was fun. I had wanted a dog for so many years and because of being an agent and being single I never really felt comfortable getting a puppy and I wanted a golden retriever because I was working too much, gone too many hours, 
you know, there isn't anybody there at home who can step in when you can't come home, you know, after 12 hours. So I was in a position where work and home were close to each other. And so I got this golden retriever puppy and I was just really interested, I guess, in training the puppy. And if I hadn't done the cadaver work, I may have gone to something like agility or therapy dog. But I happened upon this guy at Quantico doing the body recovery class. And I said, let me try it. So then I would use these, these things that I had, whether it was the soil or the bones or the blood, I stored them in my garage in, in glass jars. And I would create a problem when I came home from work. I would create a problem either in the garage or out in the yard. And so she was a very disciplined, in a good way. She, she knew how to play too. It, was nothing, it wasn't strict. She just loved the playing. And, but we played every day. Every single day I came home and we did a problem. So consequently, um, you could probably ask anybody in the group that I volunteered with that that helped train me and Riley, and they would probably say, because I heard I've heard the instructor say it, if if some of the dogs couldn't solve the problem because you know we would be hiding things on these weekend training things, and if another dog couldn't find it, they would say, let's see if Riley can find it, and she usually could. She was really into it. She loved it. Yeah, you, you sound like a proud mama. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Well, you, you you talked about the fact that the dog's reward could mm-hmm. be a Frisbee, a ball, or some food. Mm-hmm. I have to ask you, what was your reward? My reward was learning something every time I went out there. I, I just really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the training. I enjoyed watching the success. And I enjoyed really... The, you know, the fact that we were able to find this person who had taken either taken their own life or had their life taken away from them for the family. That was really important. I want to backtrack just a little bit because you mentioned that when you were down at Quantico before you started training the dogs, that you were part of the child abduction rapid deployment team. No, it was not a rapid deployment team then. You're talking, um, you're talking more recent history than me. When I first got there, it was a child abduction serial killer unit. And over time, that unit has changed its name a number of times. And it's currently the behavioral analysis unit. Anybody of your audience who watches the show Criminal Minds, that is all about the behavioral analysis unit. And that was the unit. It's just morphed over time into different names and sometimes different areas. Like after 9-11, we, one of the units there became a counterterrorism. Most of the time, they were violent crime, looking at violent criminals. But uh, after 9-11, we looked at the hijackers as well. Were you down in the unit when Ken Lanning was there? I was. Okay. So I've done an interview with Ken Lanning and also with Jim Clemente. I take it they were both down there at the same time then? Yes, they were. Yeah. Okay. Jim and I were good friends. And, and Ken and I. Ken was there when I first got there and Jim came later. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. That gives us a, a good perspective of, of where you were. Now, mm-hmm. uh, the reason I asked that question is because once you started training Riley and you became involved in you know the the cadaver dogs did you ever have opportunities to use and and now we're getting into looking into to actual cases we'll do criminal cases and then I would love to also talk about maybe some disasters that you were also involved in after the dog became certified were you able to use your dog for some of the exact cases that you were working in the bureau? Actually, I never used the dogs on a case that I was working. Hmm. Uh, If you've talked to to Ken and Jim, then you probably know that our role back at the behavioral analysis unit was to advise others. Basically, a, a police agency or an FBI office agent would come in with a case of theirs, or we would go out to the field and work on their case. And they would show us all the evidence. 
tell us the story and we would provide for them interview strategies and profile possibly if it was an unknown offender we would provide a profile of who would be a likely person to have committed this crime so actually i can't recall that i ever worked on a case that was my case with the dogs we got requests from agencies to come and help them find you know a missing child for instance i think i i mentioned my my focus was mostly missing children and so after the first couple of days in a missing child case people come to the realization that we're probably not going to find a living child and so there were instances where i went out on others cases looking for human remains this group that i tra- that i trained with they did a lot of search and rescue as well as recovery and i purposely didn't train riley to be a search and rescue dog and the reason was because my schedule was such at work that i felt that i really could not go out and look for people you know like hikers missing in the shenandoahs that was not the reason i was doing this i was doing it to assist in cases where we were going to have to find human remains and i wanted her to have one focus search and rescue and search and recovery are close enough that i think people can do a crossover between the two but i really wanted to focus and since that was my focus at at work in my real job because this was just a collateral duty i wanted it to be really specific to search and body recovery all right now you did say you may not have gone out on your own case but mm-hmm. it does sound like the bureau did utilize your services for FBI cases or cases that the FBI was assisting uh, local law enforcement agencies with yes and you know the first one of those actually i went out as a volunteer and it wasn't until after that when riley had had her first find that my unit there would refer me to somebody who called in looking for can you direct me towards somebody who might have a cadaver dog so i did go out on some cases like that but it was usually because i was referred from another agency could you tell us about that first find because when you talk about you know what your reward was mm-hmm. i can only imagine how rewarding even if it is somebody that is deceased but it, there there has to be you know a feeling of purpose and accomplishment that you derive when riley had that first find oh it was amazing you know I, you know you you just think about all the training you've done and you know you've already done couple of years of training with this dog she was she was right around 2 years old so she had had uh, she was certified at 18 months which was really good but after that and i don't want to give too much information because um her first find was a suicide and it was a man who had had you know problems and he had gone away from his family one night and uh disappeared and so there was a lot the police agency felt that he was probably going to turn out to be a suicide you know and there are certain things that seem to go across lines when people go out and commit suicide outside you know a high spot they're looking out maybe they're on a hill or something they're looking out over the countryside and and they take their own life and and that was exactly what happened in this case and so the team that i was training with you know we went out and there's always um, a command post and you know they bring the maps out and they map out the areas and everybody gets assigned an area to take their dog and work with their dog and so i was assigned a particular area and i got in there and went back and forth and back and forth and you know you're you're looking for this scent cone and Riley kept pulling me out of my area and into another area that somebody else hadn't hadn't searched yet and so i finished what i was doing and i contacted the person who was in charge of 
assigning us to the areas. And I said, you know, we need to go over here because Riley is pulling me over there. And I, I just, you know, they always tell you, listen to your dog. And so sure enough, we went over into that segment and she made a beeline right to where he was. Actually, I didn't allow her to go that close. So I didn't know what was going to happen, how she was going to react. So they brought another dog in, a more experienced dog. And so they were actually the ones who went up and and saw him. But I could see where he was from where we stopped. But yeah, afterwards, it was like, wow, it works. It really works. All these months of training and yeah, she can do it. Yeah. Wow. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I can only imagine. I'm of uh, you know what that felt like, you know, to to know that uh, you know y- you were bringing closure, you know, to a family. Absolutely. Yeah. I I do want to talk a little bit about criminal cases. During a criminal case, right. when law enforcement asks for a c- cadaver dog to be part of the team, do you need to have a search warrant if you're say, going on private property? Well, yeah, you would have to have a search warrant, just like sending an agent or an officer onto the property. If somebody doesn't willingly allow you to go on the property, then you have to get a search warrant and say what you're looking for and where you're looking for it. When people think about cadaver dogs, they are not necessarily recognizing that this is another investigative tool that agents can use or our law enforcement officers can use, but you have to use those tools within the constraints of law enforcement and legal policies and procedures. That's absolutely right. Like any other tool in our toolbox when we're conducting an investigation, a dog is one of them, you know, and you you wouldn't want to rely totally on on a dog, just like you wouldn't want to rely totally on anything else, a statement, for instance, or some other piece of evidence. Of course, the big criminal case review that I would like to to end the topic with is 9-11. But I do want to just go through maybe just one more. You just told us one where it was a service fine. Do you also have a, a case that you could talk about that was a criminal assignment where this was, you know, you were actually looking for a murder victim? Well, um, one case, actually, it's been such a long time, but as I was sitting here mulling over, I remembered one other case that uh, we went down to North Carolina. And this is typical of the kinds of cases you might be called on. This was a police officer who had been murdered somewhere. And they were getting information that the guy who actually carried it out was murdered by someone else and buried in North Carolina. And so this is what we call elimination, basically. You have to go and search the area in question and determine whether or not this is truthful information. And I alluded to this a little earlier, but I did remember a specific case We were down there probably four days, and we covered a tremendous amount of area with five dogs and five handlers, and we were able to go back to this agency and tell them that we were convinced that there was nothing to this guy's story. That's a typical use of cadaver dogs is to eliminate as well as to find. That's very interesting. I don't think a lot of people would have thought about that aspect. So we just went through recognizing 9-11 you know, just a few weeks ago. And so I'm sure that your memories and thoughts about the work you did during that time period is very fresh. Mm-hmm. Where were you when you, know, you learned that the towers and the Pentagon had been attacked? Well, I have a very unusual story in regard to that, because in addition to being an FBI agent, I was a Navy reservist. I was a commander in the Navy, and I stood watch two weeks a year as a reservist at the Pentagon. And my watch assignment was Navy Department duty captain in the Navy Command Center. And so I was on 
one week of my active duty and I was working the mid watch, which meant that I got off at eight o'clock in the morning and I had started my duty week on Sunday and I left the Pentagon at about 8.30 in the morning on that Tuesday morning. And I drove home to Fredericksburg where I lived and turned the TV on and saw that the World Trade Center had been hit. And I'm from New York originally, and I, I have uh, relatives. My brother worked down in the uh, financial district. My brother-in-law worked at the fish market down there. So I started really worrying. And while I was watching this on TV, uh, the Pentagon got struck. And I started calling the Navy Command Center. And of course, nobody answered because that was one of the main areas that got hit. In fact, the guy who relieved me and 30 plus other people died in that space that morning. The Navy, my command, asked me if I would be liaison officer to one of the families of our missing, one of our missing officers. Called the Bureau, of course, and said, this is, this is the situation. They said, go ahead, finish out your week, and we'll see you next week. So I finished out my week at the home of one of our fallen officers, being liaison, you know, in my uniform, answering the phone, the door, their questions. And I got home the following Sunday, and I got a phone call from the Washington field office saying, you've been identified as somebody who might have cadaver dogs. And I said, yes, I do. And they said, do you know anybody else? And I said, yes, I do. And so between a Washington Metropolitan Police Officer and myself, we put together 29 dog and handler teams that would work for the next two weeks, 12 days down in the parking area of the Pentagon. So that's where I was. You know, sometimes I ask a question and... I don't know what to expect. And I think I'm just kind of sitting here just because I had no idea. Wow. You know, the interesting thing about that, people have said to me afterwards, gosh, wasn't that so hard? That Sunday, I showed up there at midnight with, uh, with both of my dogs. And actually, we had uh, five FBI agents, myself included, who came in from all over the U.S., and they all had cadaver dogs that we had all just been training our dogs individually out in the field as part of volunteer groups. There were police agencies, fire departments, volunteers, and the five of us. And so we showed up. Uh, I worked night shift for the two weeks. We'd go in in the evening and then leave in the morning after 12 hours. We would go through they would, here's what happened. Initially, they had the FEMA team of dogs inside looking for survivors. When they were satisfied that there were no survivors, that's when they brought the cadaver dog teams in. And how they would work it is they would, they would scoop out from the Pentagon, the debris, and take it into a, a dump truck around to the north side of the Pentagon where they had the parking area completely cordoned off. And they would put that pile into the parking area and we would go in first with the dogs and they would make a sweep. We'd bring the dogs out and then they would go in. The evidence technicians would go in with rakes. But I've told people every time we went through a pile, my dogs found something. And you wondered, are they going to be able to find through the fire and the fuel will they be able to smell what they need to find? And they could. Dogs know. The interesting thing for me was people have said, didn't you find it really hard to be working there because you had left people who died? And I said, you know what? I'm one of the lucky ones because so many people after 9-11 felt so helpless. And I truly felt like I was doing something worthwhile. It was rewarding for me. Yeah, I I can relate to that because you know, as you know, and if we as we've stated on the show many many times, everybody in the FBI wanted to help, wanted to be involved, and I can tell you, you know, there was deep disappointment when some of us, including me, weren't able to go to the different crime scenes. But we all had assignments, and we all were able to contribute. 
but definitely not in the concrete, immediate way that you were able to do. This is a crime scene. I guess you're participating in evidence collection. Yeah. In our case, we're looking for human remains, but they were also looking for personal personal belongings and classified material and evidence of the crime, obviously, you know, pieces of the airplane and, and things like that and any kind of identifiers. So, yeah. So, you know, how it would work, we would go through the pile and we wore Tyvek suits, but no, they had available for us some kind of face mask, you know, to cover your nose and mouth. But in order to communicate with the dogs, we, we, for the most part, didn't wear those. And the dogs, it, <laughs> people brought, when they heard dogs were working, people brought everything. They bought booties, they bought leashes and collars, they bought food, everything. Veterinarians and vet techs were there on a volunteer basis, and they had those plastic pools set up. And so when you came out of the, the area where, where the material had been brought, you would come out of there and we would, you know, take our Tyvek suits off and wash and the vet techs would take the dogs and put them in the pool and wash their paws and their bodies and everything and disinfect them. I have done an episode about first responders who have either died or had illnesses from breathing in toxins during 9-11. Are you participating in those studies? I am participating. I have registered with the World Trade Center Health Program and the Victim Compensation Fund. And part of when you get registered and get accepted into the program, they send you out pretty quickly, actually, to uh, have a full medical evaluation, which I have had. And I don't have any illnesses that have been identified, but I am And just so people know, you still have to register with the Victim Compensation Fund now, even though you don't need it, because down the road, if you need it, then you're already registered. They have you on file. So that was just a simple registration. But yes, I have. I have done that. And I would encourage anybody listening who is a first responder to do the same. In regard to the dogs, there's a um, veterinarian at University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Otto is her name. And um, she was involved in the aftermath in getting a study. She she began a study of the dogs of 9-11. And so my dogs, uh, for five years, I think, afterwards, they, they had MRIs of their snouts done. And they were never, nothing was ever identified. I'm not sure that the dogs live long enough to to have, you know, developed any of these illnesses because it seems like a lot of our agents who are being identified now, that's a long time since. And th- none of those dogs are alive. The last one died about a year ago, I think. But no, um, they had the MRIs. And actually, a company called Veterinary Pet Insurance provided them with free insurance for the rest of their lives. That's and, fantastic, yeah. And how long did you say you worked down there in the, in the parking lot of, of the Pentagon? 12 days. And, and during that time, it sounds like that you were able to recover a number of uh, human remains. I think everybody who went in there, at least my dogs, every time they went into the pile, they identified something. And then the evidence techs would come out and pick it up. You know, my dog would identify it. In Riley's case, she would put her nose down on something and somebody would come in and and pick it up. Now, you have to understand, and and this gets to the, you know, to the ugly side of it, the debris that was brought out, you couldn't identify it as anything in particular. So the fact that we had the dogs there to identify something by scent was so extremely important. I can imagine so. When people think about 9-11, I'm not sure if they're fully aware of all of the people, all of the investigative tools and methods that were used in order to go through that crime scene. And they talk about, um, you know, the 9-11 dogs and and they talk about the World Trade Center. and, And one place that nobody really ever talks about is out in Staten Island at Fresh Kills where they brought everything from lower Manhattan over to Staten Island 
so they could sort through. Right. They, they used uh, recovery dogs out there as well. I did not know that cadaver dogs were used there. I, you know, I, I, I've heard about the conveyor belts and the mounds and mounds of, of mm-hmm. debris, and but no, you know, see, mm-hmm. so here I am as you know a retired FBI agent who thought I knew everything about 9-11 and what we did during those days and uh, was not aware of cadaver dogs used at Fresh Kills. I don't know if, uh, if it's come out in any of your um, other interviews, but right now, so far, we have lost 15 special agents to diseases that are identified with having originated because of their work at the World Trade Center. And there are approximately 30 more who are ill. I was able to, you know, I had the honor of doing an interview with Jean and Tom O'Connor, who were members of the FBI Agents Association, who have now since retired. They retired on 9-11. And we did an entire episode where we talked about 9-11 first responders and the illnesses and 9-11 line of duty deaths. Episode 162. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I forgot about that. So, you know, we've we've talked about how you've kind of orchestrated your own career, starting in the behavioral science unit where you learned about cadaver dogs and, and how you took it on your own to create your own specialized area of expertise. What I'd like to do now, though, is is take you back to the very beginning and ask, when did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? I joined the FBI in 1985. I had this father who was an FBI agent long before me. And when I first started listening to his stories, there were no women FBI agents. And, you know, he was a, he was a character. And I remember when he first came home in 1972 and said that they were going to start making women FBI agents. And he didn't like that very much. So I told him I was going to wait until he retired and then I was going to ask for his badge. And he sort of cocked his head and looked at me and said, well, if it was you, it would be okay. (laughs) I like that story. I followed him. He was also in the Navy. He was on a ship in World War II. And and so uh, I had the big idea, since that's what he did, that maybe that would work for me. So I went in the Navy first and spent six years on active duty and came out and went into the Bureau a couple of years later. And now I have a niece who's an agent. Oh, fantastic. The family business. The family business. And she has my father's badge, which I had, and now she has. And we all have the same credential number. Fantastic. Of course, he changed his mind about you, but did your (laughs) father change his mind about women in general before he retired? Oh, he did. He did. He worked with a couple of really great women agents and, you know, I met them over the years and yeah, you know, he was just a curmudgeon. He wasn't used to certain things. Well, he came to my ship when I was in the Navy and um, they all knew, you know, what he was like. And so they, we, we got the ship underway and he came on the, the cruise with us, the dependence cruise and all the people on the bridge of the ship, including myself were female. And uh, that was a joke we played on him. Uh. <laughs> pretty funny. <laughs> oh, I could know. Because I, I was thinking, really? Wow. Yeah. I was the officer of the deck, and then every other person up there, right down to the lookouts, were women. But you set that up for the purpose of uh, poking of seeing him. his reaction, yes. We wanted d- to see his reaction, and he loved it. He oh, loved great. it. great. Yeah, that makes me smile. So... In addition to your assignment down at the uh, Behavioral Science Unit, what offices were you in and and what kind of other work did you do? Well, after graduation from the academy, I went to Louisville, Kentucky. That was my first office where I worked white-collar crime and bank robberies, kidnappings, extortions, violent crime. Then I transferred to the New York office where I worked Italian organized crime and then non-traditional, which would be Chinese gangs. Asian gangs, actually, and uh, Jamaican posse. That's uh, when I got promoted and went down to Quantico. 
to what was previously the Missing Exploited Children's Task Force, the Child Abduction Serial Killer Unit, and finally the Behavioral Analysis Unit. And I left there and went to Gulfport, Mississippi, where I was the supervisory special resident agent in Gulfport, Mississippi. And following that, I went back to headquarters where I was senior liaison to the Department of Homeland Security for the FBI. And then I retired and became a contractor working uh, first in D.C. and then down here in Tampa, liaison between Central Command and FBI Tampa. Uh, So like so many of us, still with a connection to the FBI even after (laughs) retirement. Right. So what are you doing now? Now, I, um, I'm playing golf. I got an RV and I'm taking RV trips. I just got back this summer from Alaska, a two-month trip up through Canada to Alaska. And I'm getting ready to go to the conference of the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI, where I will become the new president. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's going to be busy. Having the opportunity to hear about your career and your commitment to the FBI, I don't think they could have found a better person to take over. Thank you, Jerry. I want to make sure that we have covered everything. So I'm going to give you the last word. What would you like to say? I have such admiration for the people who are in the FBI today. I think we were, you know, having grown up as part of the FBI family, there's a bond between FBI people that you can't break it. I don't believe you can break it. And I know there's lots of controversy out there right now, but I want to say that I know that agents and professional employees, support employees in the Bureau today are working just as hard as we were, and I I value them. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, in the show notes for this episode, you'll find photos of Eileen and, of course, her golden retrievers, Riley and Bailey. There's also links to a number of newspaper articles about FBI cadaver dogs at crime scenes, working search and recovery assignments. There's also a video of a police officer training his cadaver dog. It's really interesting. And there's a blog post I found that talks about the top breeds that are used to train as search and recovery dogs. I really found this episode fascinating. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. This podcast is about true crime. But if you're also interested in crime fiction, I want to invite you to join my reader team, where once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI, books written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. Nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You can join on my website or use the link in the description of this episode in your podcast app. I would love it if you also check out my books. My nonfiction, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And there's also my Philadelphia FBI Corruption Squad crime series. All of my books are available wherever books are sold. Thank you for listening to the very end. And I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.